Football Night in America, served by Applebee's. Week 18 is done. The regular season is done. The playoffs are coming. Devin McCourty, Jason Garrett, Matthew Barry here to talk about it, along with me. I'm Mike Florio. Steve Kornacki joins us momentarily. Let's start looking at some of these playoff games to play out on not just Wild Card Weekend, but it is Super <laughs> Wild Card Weekend. We get the Packers and the Cowboys. Mike McCarthy, the former Packers coach, sees Green Bay come to town. Cowboys have won 16 in a row at home. Is it a dangerous game for the Cowboys, though? It's the playoffs, right? You, you got to live on a dangerous side. But I think the key is this Cowboys offense. At home, they've been electric. They've produced at a high level. Their defense, to me, the last couple of weeks, they've stumbled a little bit. You know, have the lead. Teams are driving down. Detroit, I know they won that game, but Detroit drove right down the field, set up and gave, them chance, gave themselves a chance to win. I think the offense needs to come out and take over this game. Dak, first four, three possessions, go out there, score, score, score. Put the game away. Let Green Bay know, hey, we earned this home game and we want to take advantage of it. You know, Green Bay has been playing really well lately. Their defense the last three weeks, as good as they've played all year long, and I love the quarterback. But Dallas is better than Green Bay. And you, and you made the point, the way they've won all these games in a row down there is they start fast. Mm -hmm. And they get up a couple scores, and then Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence and all these guys pin their ears back and go. So if Dallas can play that kind of a game, which is a game they played a lot of down there at at and Stadium, they're going to blow Green Bay out of the stadium. They might, but I think one thing that Green Bay will probably do is try to run the ball against Dallas. Heading into week 18, the Cowboys were a bottom five run defense over the last month. Like, and so Aaron Jones looked really good the last couple of weeks as well. Maybe they'll get A.J. Dillon back as well. And so try to slow down the pace of the game here. The other thing is, is that Dallas offensively has been pretty one-dimensional. It's okay because Dak is playing lights out. CeeDee Lamb is playing lights out. But they haven't run the ball effectively this year as well. So I think if Green Bay can slow the ball down, slow the game down, run it effectively, try to turn Dallas into just a one-dimensional offense, maybe get a turnover or two. Sure, Dallas is going to be favored. But as Devin said, it's the playoffs. Anything can happen. Sure. And Jordan Love's playing really, really well. He really is. I think the biggest risk, too, is giving into the temptation to peek down the road because – You've got the Lions, the Rams lurking. You have to get the 49ers at some point. You don't want to take for granted the Green Bay Packers and just assume you show up and you win by 30 points. They're still going to have to go through each play, yeah. knock it out and get it done. And the Packers are a team that you could look at and say, ah, this will be easy, but they've been defying that the past several weeks. And that's the thing. In the playoffs, you can't think that way. I remember being in the playoffs. Brian Flores used to always tell us, don't think about the plays and everything else. Just take it one play at a time. Because if you have a bad play, you're like, oh, my goodness, our season's going to be over. If you have a good play, you're like, oh, we're going to go to the Super Bowl. No, just play after play. Yeah. Take it one play at a time. Don't worry about what's next. Beat the Green Bay Packers. That's your number one mission right now. Yeah, there's the old expression, don't look at the scoreboard. Nick Saban always talking about that. That gets magnified in the playoffs. Yep. Be right here, right now. Don't worry about the consequences. And if the Cowboys do that, they're going to win the game. I'll, I'll give you one other sort of dumb thing to look at here, but – Brandon Aubrey, the Cowboys kicker, has been phenomenal this entire year, but had a bad game against Washington today as well. Undrafted rookie free agent in a playoff game if the, if the game's on the line. By the way, other side of the ball, Green Bay's kicker has struggled all year long. So I just I wonder if this, if this game comes down to a field goal in the last second, you know, I would be nervous for both teams just again because Aubrey show the first time we've seen it all year Aubrey just looked human this week and as we know well about the Cowboys it may not be the kick it may be the hold of the field goal that blows <laughs> things up for Dallas to end the season all right the Lions hosting the first postseason game ever at Ford Field that stadium has been open 20 Sounds plus crazy years, <laughs> but they finally get it but be careful what you wish for here comes the quarterback who was your franchise guy all those years. He moves on. You root for him. He wins the Super Bowl, and now he's going to come back in and try to take your heart out and show it to you. I wonder how the fans are going to react. Like, you, you got to love Stafford. He put it all on the line for that organization, playing injured, some, like, crazy moments. But now he's coming back, and you're like, Stafford, don't you dare try to rain on our parade. Like, we finally got this game. But I think this Rams offense coming in, they've been clicking everywhere, running the ball with Williams, throwing the ball with Puka. I think their biggest hope for the Rams is that we can get a full-strength Cooper Cup and really get this offense going. I think Detroit's defense has to make a statement. If you want to be a good team in the playoffs, you need to be playing well on both sides of the ball, and that means this defense has to be consistent. They have to go out there, play well in the run game, 
and play well in the past game where they struggled a little bit. No doubt. You know, Stafford going back to Detroit, you can't write this stuff, right? It's, it's, it's a great story for the NFL. But I think the key to this game for me is the Rams possessing the ball. And it's about run, it's about play action, it's about movement. They got to keep golf and all those guys on the sidelines and limit their opportunities. If they give them 12 possessions in a game, I think it's going to be hard for this Rams defense to slow them down. If they give them eight because they're possessing the ball a lot and cashing in on their drives, it's going to be a different story. Yeah, to me, I think the key is which secondary shows up. Both teams have really struggled with secondary. Both teams play good run defense, but both teams have really struggled. So which passing game gets going? Which secondary shows up against the passing game? The other thing that's so – and so much talk up to this game, and I think it's the best game of the whole, whole weekend slate, but so much talk of this game is going to be Stafford returning to Detroit. But how about Jared Goff facing the coach and former team that he led to a Super Bowl? And then they kind of discarded him and sent him off to Detroit. He's led a rebuilding effort there. So Jared Goff gets to have a, host a home playoff game against the coach that got rid of him. And, like, you know, I think that – I think golf versus, golf versus Stafford, I think, is – uh, an incredible match. I also think, by the way, you've got two of the best coaches in the NFL going head-to-head -head in Sean McVay and Dan Campbell. I, I can't wait for that game. Yeah, but Stafford I, I, in excuse, Detroit. Excuse, I, Go I, ahead. I, I, love, I love the golf story that you bring him up. And, and I feel like, and you know this, you know, guys have issues. Guys have adversity in their career. And they get calloused up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think Jared Goff is a different guy than he was two or three years ago. You know, he came in with the Rams. They had some early success. Then he had some adversity. And I think he's gotten stronger and tougher as a result. And he's a better player for that team and a better leader for that team right now. With Stafford and the Lions, it was amicable. It was not amicable yeah. for Goff and the Rams. After he took him to the Super Bowl, they gave him the huge contract. And then two seasons later, they just threw their hands in the air. And they essentially gave up a first-round pick to offload that deal. So there is hard feelings there that are going to get lost in the whole Stafford storyline. So I think you just have to watch very carefully what everyone says this week. You know, Sean McVay will say all the right things. Jared Goff may say all the right things. But there's going to be a lot of heat between McVay and Goff when it's time to play. So I should game. be looking for a Goff stare down of the Rams yes. sideline. I'm looking for that on a touchdown. Yes, well, pass. Goff would have to get it down on his knees to stare down Sean McVay. But, yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's how it'll go. Okay. But certainly one last thing I'll just mention here. It will help Jared Goff a lot if Sam Laporta can play – he leaves the game. Uh, it did not tough. look yeah. good. It did not look good. And so there's a chance that a big piece of their offense might miss this game. Yeah, some criticism is going to be coming Dan Campbell's way also. I mean, you, you, they, they were playing for the two seed. They put their guys out there, and it's football. It happens. Yep. Guys can get injured, and now they're just going to have to go forward if he can't play and make their, their best case to advance. All right, the Eagles, 10-1. They've lost 5-6. It just feels like they're falling apart. They still get in, but they are limping in unlike any team I can remember in recent years. They go to Tampa Bay to the point where a lot of people are saying, hey, Tampa Bay should be able to win this game, Devin. Yeah, I think for the Eagles, you got to try to dig deep. You know, Jason hit it earlier. They talked about being resilient and coming back and, and coming after you get hit in the mouth, but we haven't seen it. But I think for this Eagles team, all right, you got to say, hey, come in Monday. We're in the playoffs, guys. Whatever else has gone on, we're here. What are we going to do now? We've seen teams sometimes not play their best ball down the stretch, not to this extent, but somehow kind of resurface, come back to life, and play well in the playoffs. And they're playing Tampa, team they beat earlier this year, so they can watch that film and say, hey, look, this is us. This is what we did against this team. Let's do this. Let's do they have to, I think, drill that home all week to try to build what I would say is some false confidence and then hope you go in there get off to a good start, and then that can develop into some real confidence. You know, they've been so good. I mean, they, they've been the team in the NFL for me over the last year and a half. And then the last month and a half, they've just fallen off the face of the earth. And I think your point about confidence and toughness, all the character things are the issues for me. And I believe they have great character guys on their team. But they're not playing hard down in and down out. They're not fighting and competing like they need to. And uh, you said it, limping into the playoffs, that's an understatement. Yeah. So go to the whiteboard, erase the whiteboard, go to the Etch-A-Sketch, shake it off, blank slate, come on in here. Hey, this is our season. Let's take it one day at a time in our preparation. Watch all the old good film. Mm -hmm. Try to get those images in your mind and go play and see what happens next Monday. One of the keys, I think, will be can Philadelphia run the ball? Because that's been such a key to their success for much of the season is the ability to run the ball, whether it's with Hurts or whether it's with Swift. 
the Packers, I'm sorry, the, Buc the Buccaneers coming into week 18 were the second best run defense over the last month. That's a, the strength of the Buccaneers defense is that defensive line where you attack them is in the secondary. And will they have A.J. Brown, who also left week 18 with an injury? That would be obviously being a big loss to the passing attack of Philadelphia. Their defense, the Eagles defense, has been bad. I mean, it's been bad all year long. I mean, they, they before they basically gave up, they got carved up by Tyrod Taylor and the Giants in Week 18. And so Baker Mayfield, who is playing really, I think, the best football of his career, and, like, when you've got Mike Evans and Chris Godwin on your side, like, that's, that's going to be a tough game. That's going to be a tough game for the Eagles. I know they're favored. I would not be shocked at all if Tampa Bay wins and, that one. And one thing I'm looking for from this Eagles defense, tackle. Yeah. Like, there's a lot to be made, talking about Desai, Matt Patricia there now. But when you watch the Eagles, it doesn't look like just this group of violent guys on defense going out there, putting shoulder pads on guys. Like, you want to go win a playoff game, start off the right way by going and laying a hit on guys. And I want to see how they start the game defensively. Interesting angle to this. It's the last game of Super Wild Card Weekend. So entering the game, the Eagles will know mm. where they go if they win, whether it's San Francisco, Dallas, or Detroit. And I think it's a different mindset. If you know, hey, if we win, we're going to San Francisco, you may have some guys thinking, I'd just as soon not go to San Francisco. And that's happened in the past, where we know the end of the road is here. We don't even get to the point to end the road there. You may have some guys who feel that way. And it just feels like right now, Coach, the locker room is just kind of wobbly and they don't have faith. And A.J. Brown has a team meeting and says you got to believe in the coaching staff, which implies they aren't believing in the coaching staff. They just got a lot to do to get these guys refocused quickly. Yeah, I'd like to think that thought that you were talking about is a subliminal thought. It might be there, but I don't think anybody has that in the forefront of our mind. Oh, we can't go beat San Francisco, so let's not play our best. They don't need to say it. Yeah. They know. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're going to play their best regardless. The biggest thing for them is, you know, we're talking about one play at a time. They have to have a short memory. Somehow they have to get this last month and a half out of their minds and kind of restart. And to me, it, it comes back to a guy like Jalen Hurts. Line one with Jalen Hurts is he's a fantastic leader. Guys play for him. So he's got to emerge on this team and kind of grab it and say, let's go. We're sitting right here. we got a great opportunity. And to Matthew's point, when they played their best, they run the football. The strength of the team are those five guys up front. Wear them out. Run the ball. Take some pressure off the quarterback. Create some one-on-ones outside. That's when they play their best offensive football. They just keep looking worse, not better. Oh. And the harder they try to get out of it, it seems like the harder it is for it to happen. All right. The Buccaneers emerged from a quagmire in the NFC South. The AFC South was jumbled as well. Steve Kornacki, show us how it played out for the Texans to emerge as the champs. Yeah, Mike. I mean, it looked pretty clear cut about six weeks ago, and it looked like it was not going to be the Houston Texans to get that four seed to win the AFC South and to get the home game. In fact, take you back right here. This is... Right after the Texans, this is six weeks ago, they had just lost to the Jags. They were two games behind in the AFC South, and their chances of even making the playoffs, according to our PFF model, were just 34% then. Don't forget, they still had a hiccup with the Stroud injury uh, a couple weeks later, but they ended up winning, you know, to close out the season a couple games here. They won the game on Saturday night to clinch the wild card, and then they caught a big break on Sunday with the Jags losing to Tennessee, and in fact, that was just the latest in a long line of breaks that Houston had been catching from Jacksonville because this same point where Jacksonville was 34% to make the playoffs six weeks ago, remember the Jags were sitting there eight and three. They were 96% to make the playoffs. We were talking one seed in the AFC. Could they make the Super Bowl? They are going to end up out of the playoffs altogether from a 96% chance six weeks ago. And talk about a reversal of fortune. Remember last season? Remember when the Jags were 3-7, and seven, reeled off six of their last seven? They, at the same point in the season last year, they had just a 3% chance of making the playoffs, and they made it in. So 96% didn't hold up. 3% they made it last year. Remember, those probabilities aren't definite. This is living proof. Great stuff, Steve. Stick around. All right, let's look at the champion of the AFC South, the Houston Texans, the one team that I think most people would have said has no chance in the AFC to make it. They make it. They win the division. Good news, bad news. Good news, you're in. Bad news, here come the Browns. And the Browns beat them there not that long ago, but they didn't have C.J. Stroud. And I think C.J. Stroud, we saw that Saturday night. C.J. Stroud makes all the difference for that Texans team. They just feed off of everything he does. Nothing like getting your guy back, right? But I think the big thing for me in this game is this defense has to step up. 
with or without C.J. Stroud, when you take the field as a defense, you got to show up. C.J. Stroud's not coming to help you play defense. And the last time they played this team, Amari Cooper over 200 yards. Joe Flacco threw the ball all over the field. They have Will Anderson, who played with a bum ankle last week. Grenard missed the game. So those are two of your better guys rushing the passer. Jerry Hughes got banged up in the game as well. So they have to get that together because Cleveland has showed they are very willing to let Flacco drop back 40 times, throw the ball. So I, I think this Houston Texans team has been a great story. But if they want to continue this Cinderella story, this defense needs to step up and make plays against Cleveland. And not only in the passing game, but in the running game. You know, Jonathan Taylor for, for the Colts ran wild yeah. the other night. So they've been vulnerable in both areas. And for me, Cleveland needs to run the ball more, take some pressure off of Flacco. As good as he's been, sometimes he's putting the ball in harm's way. So if they can get a more balanced formula, control the line of scrimmage, run the football, all those play-action passes come alive. And now Amari Cooper is by himself out there. And it's going to be a tough combination for them. I like Cleveland in the game. Yeah, look, I think this this is a fascinating matchup, right? So you've got, to me, the two most deserving Coaches of the Year candidates in Kevin Stefanski and D'Amico Ryans, right? You've got two great stories in C.J. Stroud, the rookie who's played out of his mind, and Joe Flacco, who's been among the hottest quarterbacks in the NFL over the last six weeks, off of his couch two months ago, right? So you've got both these guys. I think that the way that the Texans win this game is obviously – on the arm of C.J. Stroud. I'm with you, Devin. The, the defense is going to step up because you know Cleveland's defense will be there as well. Yeah. But if they can stop Amari Cooper, there's not a lot else on that offense. They've found something with Njoku, obviously, and you've got some Elijah Moore there. But really, like the pa it's, it's been Joe Flacco throwing the ball 40 times and a lot of it going to Amari Cooper and David Njoku because if you can stop at least one of them and get to Flacco, who's not that mobile, if Will Anderson and, and that line can create pressure, then I think they've got a chance. The other thing I'll just say here is that people have been counting out the Texans all year long. They'll count them out in this game as well. And so it is clear that that entire team has bought into D'Amico Ryans as well. And he'll have them fired up. I think it's going to be a great game. Yeah. I think the fact that the Browns beat them the last time around actually is going to work against the yeah. Browns. It's going to make it a little bit harder. And at some point, we've seen the backup quarterbacks turn into a pumpkin. And I just wonder where the edge is, Coach. Joe Flacco, yes, he's getting more comfortable as he plays more games, but with each game, there's more film. And D'Amico Ryans and the defensive coaching staff can figure out how to confound him, maybe bait him into making a bad throw. And all it takes is one big moment. And the whole momentum is swung. Yeah, which is why I go back to don't make it all about Joe Flacco. Make it about your defense, one of the best defenses in the league. Put, put Houston's offense in bad situations. Don't turn the ball over. Run it and take your shots and be a little bit more measured. If they throw it 40 times a game, it's, it becomes a little bit of a high wire act. They can be more balanced and beat this team. Yeah, they do not want to get into a shootout with Houston. I agree with you, Coach. Well, those two teams are in the playoffs along with 12 others. The Patriots for the second straight year – are not, and there is an air of inevitability at this point. It's been a talking point for so long. There's been no clear indication from New England or no indication at all that it's going to be anything other than a parting. It just feels like it's a matter of which day this week we're going to find out that Bill Belichick and Robert Kraft are moving on after 24 years together. Yeah, and if that is the case, we were sitting in the viewing room, and, and Jason and Chris, they asked me, what are, what are one of your most memorable moments with Coach Belichick? And I think... One of the things he doesn't get credit for, we always talk about how hard he is on teams. We talked about you win games, he comes in with not the highlights, we watch the lowlights. He tells us all the things we did bad. But I remember back in my second year where I was struggling, every, it seemed like every time I did an interview, they were telling me all the bad plays I had, all those things. And I remember after we played Miami at the end of the season, Bill comes in the squad meeting room in front of the whole team, and he says, Devin, I don't care what anybody says about you, I'll take you on this team wow. on any given wow. Sunday. And what I loved about him was anytime he said something like that about a player, it wasn't coming up to the guy in the uh, lunch line or something like that. It was in the squad meeting to let that guy know how he felt about him in front of the entire team and coaching staff. That's the type of coach he was. Not just a hard, you know, coach every day of the week and willing you to win. He was also a guy that understood how hard players work. And when they earned his respect, he wanted them to know. Yeah, he's the ultimate ball guy. I mean, he's old school as old school is, and, and you see that in everything he does, how he coaches the team, how he talks about football, how he makes it about everybody else. It's not about individuals. It's about team, all that kind of stuff. And even though these last few years haven't been great, this last year being pretty miserable up there in New England, when you look at the body of work, it's rare 
and I'm not even talking about the NFL. You could put this in any league at any level. What they did up there and, and the, the, the collaboration between Belichick and Brady is one of the great combinations we've ever seen in sports. And uh, it's been a model franchise forever. He's the guy that has everything to do with creating that. So uh, I still think he wants to coach football. So if it's not New England, it's going to be somewhere. Yeah, listen, I, I'm still shocked by this. It, it feels like you're right. Like, it, just all the tea leaves feel to seem that there's going to be a parting of the ways here. I'm just still shocked a bit because uh, I agree with you, Coach. Like, if ever there was a coach of a professional sports franchise that should be able to say, like, here's how and when I'd like to go out, it's Bill Belichick. And so the fact that he's maybe getting a little bit of a push or that there's some friction there is just shocking to me. Uh, I think what will be interesting to see is – Wherever he, if he does in fact move on and he goes somewhere else, will he will he give in to a general manager or will he need total control? Because as brilliant as Belichick is as a as a game as a game coach and as a you know as a, as an X's and O's guys, the drafting has been hit or miss. You know what I mean? And some of the free agents have not worked out as well. And so I think Belichick, the general manager, has not helped out Belichick, the head coach, over the years. And so I think he'd be better served to have somebody else worry about that and let him just worry about on the field. And I've used the example before right here of Robert Kraft going skydiving when it's time to jump out of the plane. Is he going to do it? And there is trepidation there because <laughs> the, the Patriots recognize he is one hell of a coach. He gets <laughs> players ready to play. He knows what's going to happen from studying the film. He knows how to press people's buttons to get the most out of them. But it's the other things, you know, the ways that they think maybe the evolution of the game has – because he – he knows his way. He's doing it his way. They see other techniques, other strategies, and they think, well, maybe we need to modernize what we're doing. But he could go somewhere else, and it could all fall together, and he could be as successful with a new team coach as Tom Brady was when he left. Yeah, and sometimes it's, it's just time to start over. 24 years is a long yeah, time. Yeah, 24 years in the <laughs> NFL is a lifetime. And some, you, you want a new energy in a building Bill Belichick probably wants a new energy, too, and uh, get a new opportunity, clean that slate, build it from scratch, how he's done it. Uh, nobody's more qualified or capable of doing that than he is. And again, at approaching 72 years old, he wants to coach football. What I know about him is he loves all the little stuff that a lot of people get tired of. You know, practicing, watching the tape, evaluating the players, all that stuff. I think he still embraces it. So he's still got a lot of juice. It'll be fun to see what happens. Devin, if you could choose one franchise for him to go to that isn't the Patriots, where would you choose? I I'm choosing where I think the best quarterback is. So I would say the Chargers. I, I think him with a quarterback that's ready to win. As great as Tom Brady was as a player, Tom will tell you, like, the things that Bill would tell you that were going to happen in the game, I think one of the greatest scenes is him and Bill sitting down watching Ed Reed. Like, those discussions of what Ed's thinking, how the defense is going to attack. You give Justin Herbert a guy that's telling him, this is what we saw when we played against you. This is what defenses are going to do to take away what you do well. Sky's the limit. Whoever's coaching the Patriots and calling the shots will have an opportunity to perhaps draft a quarterback high. Steve Kornacki, tell us about the draft order for 2024. Yeah, I mean, look, this is the silver lining Patriots fans have been thinking about for a while this season. And if it is Bill Belichick's final season as the head coach and general manager of the Patriots, a heck of a gift to his successor. This is the draft order now for 2024 set as a result of Week 18. And you see the New England Patriots are going to pick number three in the NFL draft. There ends up being a three-way tie here for that second pick. An interesting little way they do this here, it's by strength of schedule to break a tie, but it's the weaker schedule gets the better pick. So the Commanders had the weakest schedule. They get the second pick. The Patriots, the second weakest. They're the third pick. The Cardinals had the strongest schedule of these three teams. Therefore, they're punished with the fourth pick overall. But we say a gift potentially to Belichick's successor if that's the case. The last time the Patriots pick this high in an NFL draft. You got to go back to 1993. A new coach came in, new president of football operations. His name was Bill Parcells. He used the top pick in the NFL draft to draft a franchise quarterback, Drew Bledsoe. Four years later, Parcells, Bledsoe were in the Super Bowl. All right, it's speed round time. In honor of the Golden Globes, we're going to go around the horn for some of the awards to be determined. They'll be officially announced the Thursday before the Super Bowl. The voting happens this week. Let's start with... Coach of the year, Devin. Oh, I get to go first. I'm going with D'Amico Ryans. I think we talked about it. Stefanski, D'Amico Ryans, both did a great job. But taking this team from worst to first in that division, 
I think unbelievable. Big credit to him, C.J. Stroud, that team, but D'Amico Ryans, he really got this team to believe. I'm going to echo that. Stefanski, for me, would be the runner-up. But, you know, D'Amico, if you think about where Houston has been in the last few years, I mean, they've been a disaster. And for him to go in there in year one and do what he's done, they got a couple cornerstone players there on either side of the ball. He's got them going. He's got them believing. And they're hosting a playoff game. It's pretty, pretty impressive. <laughs> Ryans would get my vote as well. Preseason win total was set at 6.5 for the Texans. Rookie quarterback, he dealt with injuries too, losing Tank Dell. The offensive line was beat up. But if Ryans and Stefanski were off the table, just to throw one more name in there, what about the job John Harbaugh has done in Baltimore? I mean, I think he gets – unfortunately, coaches get knocked for having great players, but you've got to get something out of those great players. Again, Chargers had Justin Herbert, you know, and Brandon Staley's looking for work now. So, like, bringing in Todd Munkin, that defense is playing as good as any defense in the NFL – it's the best season we've seen from Lamar. Um, it's really incredible what John Harbaugh's done with the Ravens this year. They're, they're as good a team as there is in the league. The problem is the coach of the year goes to the coach whose team most exceeded the expectations yeah. going into the yeah. season. Which is so why they I should, think Ryan's. They yeah. should have a name for Bill Belichick. They have, should have a Belichick <laughs> award that goes to the coach who was expected to kick ass and did. did so. Kyle Shanahan would get that one, right? Okay. He just gets forgotten. Yes. But they, they're the one seed, and they are nonstop, and he's never going to get acknowledged because we expect him to be great every year. All right, Offensive Rookie of the Year. Offensive Rookie of the Year, let's go back down to Houston. I, it's C.J. Stroud, I think, <laughs> what he's been able to do. And I think you really knew this was award when he got hurt and how much this team struggled without him. Yeah, they beat Tennessee, but it was a struggle. He comes back, he plays, they play against Indy, they go out there and win a game when they need it the most, shows what he's about. I hate to keep echoing your answers, but I'm going to say C.J. Stroud as well. You know, I had a chance to be around Dak Prescott as a rookie, and I was just amazed because I know how hard playing the quarterback position is. And this, the year that he's had rivals what Dak did in 2016. For this guy to play at this level – with a team that's not necessarily loaded all around him. And uh, week in and week out, produce when he's not in, they kind of fall off. Uh, he's been really impressive, and he's got those guys believing. I would vote for C.J. Stroud as well if I had a vote. It's a quarterback. Look, he was – the performance he put up on Indianapolis to get them into the playoffs – was magnificent, and that's on national TV. Everyone saw it. It was a standalone game. But just to throw another name in the hat, how about Puka Nakua as a fifth-round rookie sets the receiving record? He's in the NFL record books as a rookie wide receiver. And so just the kind of year that I think in any other year, Puka Nakua is your yeah, runaway definitely. winner. It's yeah. just Stroud has just had such a magical year. But I do think Puka Nakua deserves a lot of votes. I mean, it's not quite the NFL's equivalent of the Joe DiMaggio hitting streak, but it goes back to 1960. Bill Groman <laughs> of the Houston Oilers in the first year of the AFL. That's how long that record was on the books, and Puka Nakua beat it. And, and it, it's hard to argue C.J. Stroud with how he's transformed that team in one year when we expected nothing from them. Defensive Rookie of the Year. Mr. Defensive back. I think you could get different people in this, but I would go, again, back down to Houston. I think Will <laughs> Anderson. And I think this now is a credit to probably the GM of the year, Nick Casario, and getting D'Amico Ryan's, drafting C.J. Stroud, and then drafting Will Anderson, trading up to get Will Anderson, where he's made a difference on this defense, rushing the passer, getting out there. And I thought he showed the type of character being a rookie and a captain by going out there Week 18, limping around, but playing on a high ankle sprain, showed his leadership. Same. Why does Dev always get to go first? <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. I'll go to thing. you for the next one. Yeah, and, no, and the excitement part of it, if you're a Houston Texan fan, is you have cornerstone players. These guys are going to be in these positions for the next 10 yep. years. And when you draft high, you better draft right, and they've certainly done that. Yeah, why do I get to go third? <laughs> but I would have said Will Anderson as well, but again, just to put another name in there, I think Jalen Carter of Philadelphia, it's been a tough year for the Eagles defense, but one of their bright spots has been Jalen Carter, who's just had a mo an unbelievable year, and I, I think he's going to get a lot of votes as well. Carter faded down the stretch. Kobe Turner of the Rams, nose tackle, yep. he really came on late. A lot of sacks, hard to get sacks when you're an interior defensive lineman. He got a lot of them down the stretch. Devin Witherspoon also from the Seahawks made some noise this year. All right. Coach, you yeah. get to go first. You're going to go second. All right. Comeback player of the year. Comeback player of the year. We had a great debate about this as we're watching Ooh. it. Um, I'm going to say Joe Flacco to think about this guy coming off the couch and what he did.
for the Browns. The Browns aren't in the playoffs if they don't make that decision. So kudos to them for going out and getting this guy who's played really well for a long time in the NFL, and then he came into Cleveland and really helped them win a ton of games down the stretch and put them in a great position in the playoffs. Yeah, I think it depends on sort of what the award is, to your point about the debate, right? Is it just somebody that overcame massive adversity? If, it, if that's what it is, it's DeMar Hamlin who literally was pronounced dead a year ago, right? And now he's playing in an NFL game. Now he's on a roster. Now he hasn't played a ton of snaps this year. He hasn't had a huge impact. But the fact of the matter is, given what he went through last year, the fact that he's still playing football, that he's still on an NFL roster, still active in some games, like, we've seen this before. I think about Alex Smith, who came back from a gruesome injury, played a couple of games for, the, for Washington, but, you know, didn't put up huge numbers or anything like that. But, again, just an unbelievable comeback. But if you're talking just pure playing, Give me Baker Mayfield over Joe Flacco, who, you know, four teams in, in, uh, in, a, in a year, playing his best ball, I think, of his, of his career. He leads the Buccaneers. There, were, there was talk in the preseason of can he beat out Kyle Trask? And now he's the NFC South champion, threw for almost 4,000 yards. Like, he had, a, he had a great year statistically and also on the NFL field. And they've got a chance not only to, to play in the playoffs, but to, to go far. I'll go outside the box, and I do want to credit. I think DeMar Hamlin's story is unbelievable. But here's a guy who we thought this team was going to have to rebuild. After they won the Super Bowl, it was all over. How about Matt Stafford and what he's come back and done this year with this team, taking a fifth-round draft pick like Puka Nakua, making him a star once they lost Cooper Cup? We didn't think this was possible. How about Matthew Stafford? Well, and I've seen that name out there, and it does make some sense. It's going to be a strange argument for a lot of people because DeMar Hamlin, it was a, we viewed it as a given. If this guy comes back yep. and plays in one game, one snap, he gets it. And now we're kind of like, well, has he played enough? And I think that's going to be part of the debate. I forgot to do defensive player of the year. Real well, quickly. L l l the Hamlin story, let me just say it out loud, is one of the great stories all any, time, no doubt about of, of all, all time. time in football. Yep. So that somehow should be recognized. I don't know if it's with this award, but what, what an inspirational story for everyone. It might be creating his own award. That's true. You know? That's true. Okay, real quickly, defensive player of the year, because I skipped over it accidentally. Go ahead. I don't want to go first anymore. Yeah, w w one of my just all-time favorite players is T.J. Watt. A and you think about... At different times, Pittsburgh really struggled offensively. Yeah. And it seemed like in all those <laughs> games, he's knocking the ball in the air, catching it, running it in, strip sack. He's always the guy that that team fed off of, I think, 16 or 17 sacks right now. He's just an amazing player, and the whole team seems to go through him. I'll go with Miles Garrett. Browns are the number one defense. He's the star of that defense. He's had an unbelievable year. I think the voters will want to reward the Browns and their season somehow. And to me, the easiest way is Miles Garrett, Defensive Player of the Year. I would normally echo that, but being a defensive backup here, bringing Antoine Winfield That's Jr., good. Good. not a pro bowler, but defensive player of the year, he's had an unbelievable season. Like you said with Baker Mayfield, they've come back, they won the NFC South, and a lot of that defensively has been him, whether it's forced fumbles, sacks, interceptions. He's made plays, fumble recoveries. He's just done everything for this defense. Great player this year. And it's been fun to watch the coaches make the cases for their guys throughout the season. <laughs> I'll be impressed the time that a head coach makes a case for somebody, somebody not on his team. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's it for week 18. We appreciate your time as always. We'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.